In today's video, we explore the mysteries of the short-lived but very cool Dungeons & Dragons Chainmail Miniatures game from 2001. So back in 2018, Lynn and I were traveling through the friendly town of Mason City, Iowa, population 27,000, and while we were there, we stopped to visit one of the local hobby stores, a very cool place called Now and Then, because you never know what you might find, and who knew if we'd ever pass that way again. So while I was browsing the store displays, I noticed a small collection of brightly illustrated yellow boxes for a 2001 skirmish miniatures game called Dungeons & Dragons Chainmail, which I had never heard of. I was familiar with the early chainmail rules. I purchased this copy directly from TSR Mail Order back in the early 1980s, but this later incarnation of chainmail was news to me, though granted I wasn't gaming much during the 1990s and 2000s, so I did miss out on a lot of things. When I asked the store owner about the chainmail minis, he said they were old stock that turned up while they were reorganizing the storage area, and they just kind of put them out on the shelf to see if anybody would buy them. Well, my curiosity was piqued anyway, and the price was right, so I purchased the small chainmail collection they had, and then Lynn and I hit the highway. When we returned home, I did a bit of research and confirmed that the Dungeons & Dragons chainmail miniatures game was launched in 2001 by Wizards of the Coast. The game was heavily supported with miniatures, expansions, and apparently even DCI-sanctioned events, but despite all that, was abruptly discontinued in the summer of 2002. In its place, Wizards launched the Dungeons & Dragons miniatures game in 2003, which used pre-painted plastic figures instead of metal minis, had a more streamlined rule set, and would be supported in various incarnations until around 2011. So Chainmail's two-year lifespan seems shockingly brief to me for a game that looks pretty well designed, had a wide rollout with plenty of product, and was tied to the larger Dungeons & Dragons brand. However, Chainmail must not have resonated with D&D players, and apparently did not catch on with tabletop wargamers either. I suppose fantasy wargamers already had access to Warhammer and Mordheim, and perhaps trying to convince 3rd edition Dungeons & Dragons players to paint and base miniatures for a D&D adjacent skirmish game was just a bridge too far. If you have any insight or opinions on that, please leave a comment in the comment section. I'd be very interested to hear what you think. Anyway, even though Chainmail flamed out almost immediately, I think the box art, miniatures, and game materials are pretty darn cool, and the Chainmail figures, new in box, are still relatively affordable on the secondhand market. As you can see, I picked up a starter set, some faction boxes, and a host of individual minis in the years since we visited Mason City. So since D&D has been trending on social media lately for a variety of reasons, I thought it might be fun to revisit some of the 2001 and 2002 Chainmail releases, beginning with these smaller boxes that we purchased back in 2018. Here we have a couple of gnolls. We have a demonic gnoll adept and a gnoll trooper, and they both belong to the Naresh faction. Naresh warbands are made up of gnolls, gnoll demon hybrids, and foul creatures from the abyss. They follow the half-demon priest king Yanger, who wants to tear the heart out of the elf kingdom of Ravilla, and open up the Abyssal Gateways. We'll start with the Knoll Trooper here. We should get a single mini, a base, and a stat card. This is a three-part metal mini, and currently his head is just kind of tenuously balanced on his neck there. I like this sculpt quite a lot. I think he really embodies the look of an old-school D&D Knoll. Here he is next to a classic plastic Cadian, and you'll notice that the Knoll is quite a bit taller. But that's just because the Knolls tend to tower over most everybody else, most of the regular chainmail commanders and troopers aren't nearly that large. Here is the demonic knoll adept, who is described as a healer, a killer, a spiritual guide, and a war leader. This is another really nice sculpt and kind of reminds me of the old confrontation figures from Rackham. Here is her stat card, and so she is a commander and has quite a few abilities and spells, which is why she's 15 points and the knoll trooper is only 5. So Chainmail seems to have been designed to make things as easy as possible for new players, which makes sense if the intent was to coax RPGers into buying a tabletop miniatures game. Case in point, the game cards would really speed up warband building. You just pick the models you want and add up the points until you hit your point cap. And then during the game, most of the troop info that you need is right there on the card, with the exception of spell and ability descriptions, which are in the rulebook. This box contains two minis. There are two Dwarf Legionnaires, 
from the people state of Mordengard. And even though they're identical, each dwarf gets his own combat card. These are three-piece sculpts, but all you have to do is attach a hand to the right arm and a javelin on the back. The dwarf legionnaires are much shorter than the gnolls, which is why you probably get two in a box. However, in terms of point value, a dwarf legionnaire is equivalent to a gnoll trooper, so they are small but tenacious. This automaton-looking thing here is a hammerer. He is a gnome-built construct for the human nation of Thalos. The hammerer is a chunky three-piece metal sculpt that stands on a larger base. What he lacks in detail, he makes up in heft, and he certainly would be easy to put together. Here is a pre-painted plastic hammerer. I understand that some of the chainmail figs were sort of reimagined for the plastic line. They're not quite exactly the same, but pretty close. Maybe for the plastic mold, it was just easier to have the construct fold his arm across his chest. Here is the Chainmail Miniatures Game starter set from 2001, which contains an official rulebook, two starter warbands, stack cards, 2D train sheets, punch-out counters, and other materials. I believe there was also a full 148-page rulebook published in 2002 with a bunch of additional content. Chainmail takes place in Western Orth, the lands of the Sundered Empire, after an alliance of legendary heroes ambushes and kills Stratus, the god of war. This isn't Stratus, this is a war ape. Before he dies, however, Stratus scatters a host of powerful magic weapons across the region, sparking a never-ending conflict among the mortal factions. This conflict is destined to last until a new god of war is chosen, and this might happen if a mortal warlord somehow manages to collect all of the old gods' scattered artifacts. These yellow booklets are faction quick start guides, and then here we have some 2D terrain pieces, which I think is a nice touch. If someone's just starting out with tabletop miniatures games, they probably don't have access to 3D terrain yet, and so uh, the 2D terrain cards fit right in the box and give the players something they can use right away. Here are the game cards for the two factions included in the starter set. You get a Thalos human faction and a Noel Naresh faction. It's definitely enough to get started, but you'd need to pick up a few extra figures to play a standard 50-point game. Here are a couple of sheets of game tokens, which are primarily used to keep track of combat damage, because each unit in a warband has a certain number of hit points. Here's a closer look at the metal minis included in the starter set. You only get four per faction. But that's still enough for a basic game while keeping the model count relatively low. Perhaps that's intentional so they didn't scare off any new players with an excessive amount of building and painting. Players have six factions to choose from in Chainmail. Undead, Goblinoids, Dwarves, Gnolls, Elves, and Humans. Each faction has both commander and regular troop options. You can even build a Chainmail Warband using models from different factions as long as you don't mix the good forces with the evil ones. So Chainmail uses a d20 system for combat. Basically, an attacking model rolls a d20 and adds its attack bonus, and if it meets or exceeds the defender's armor value, then it inflicts a specified amount of damage. Chainmail uses an alternating activation system, though how many individual models a player can move during their activation depends on how large their warband is. A warband of four models will activate just one, while a warband with nine models would activate three. An activated model gets to move up to its speed stat in inches, and after that it can opt to attack, shoot, cast a spell, take a special action, or move again. The Chainmail rulebook also devotes about 20 pages to command points, orders, special abilities, and magic spells, which add a lot more depth to the game than I was expecting, though the basic game mechanics themselves are pretty straightforward and familiar. You know, line of sight, terrain effects, morale, and all that jazz. In fact, if Chainmail were published today, the fundamentals wouldn't seem that different than a lot of other games currently on the market. The Chainmail model description booklet is really interesting, I think. It covers the lore of each model in each Chainmail faction and offers tips on how to use that commander or troop model during gameplay. For example, a Wood Elf Scout can shoot twice if she doesn't move, but she's not that great in close combat, so the booklet recommends deploying her in cover and keeping her out of melee. It also says the scout should beware of fast troops like hyenas and skeletal war dogs, which are an effective counter to her, and she should use her point-blank shot ability if enemies get too close. So again, it seems like the game designers are really trying to make chainmail accessible to new players here. 
A beginner could get basic tactics for using each model in his or her warband, and as a result, perhaps not get crushed too badly in their first few games, which I think is brilliant. There's even a checklist on the back of the booklet showing all the commanders and troops available for each faction before the later expansions, along with their point costs. I especially like the troop names Battered Skeletal Troll and Slaughter Pit Zombie Knoll. This is the Build a Better Warband pamphlet. It doesn't actually provide any practical info on how to build a better warband, other than mentioning that players could expand their options by purchasing additional blister packs, combo boxes, and faction boxes. What the pamphlet does illustrate, however, is the publisher's multi-pronged strategy to support the game. Here's info on the DCI-sanctioned Dungeons & Dragons Chainmail Miniatures Game League featuring four-week seasons, championship events, and global rankings. And this page describes how Dragon Magazine was devoting three columns to chainmail each month, covering painting, modeling, strategy, and also how to use chainmail troops and commanders in the D&D RPG, and vice versa. So yeah, between the products, the events, and the coverage, Wizards was making a very concerted effort to get chainmail up and running. There were numerous chainmail expansions following the 2001 product launch. This is the Blood and Darkness Set 2 Guidebook, published in 2002, which covers subterranean skirmishes. The expansion includes new rules, abilities, spells, and scenarios, as well as information on new troop types available to each faction, plus a new range of mercenaries. There's also a list of pre-generated warbands and recommendations on how to play them, unit cards for all these Series 1 models, in case your original game cards got lost, stolen, or destroyed, and even stats for using chainmail troops and commanders in regular games of D&D, so they were trying really hard to connect the skirmish game with the RPG. And then finally, here is the Chainmail Miniatures game Ghostwind Campaign, a series of 14 connected scenarios which culminate in the recovery of Bonebreak, the legendary great club owned by Stratus, the former god of war. During the campaign, warlords have the opportunity to level up, acquire magic items, recruit new troops, and basically gear up for the epic final battle. Unfortunately, however, Chainmail was discontinued not long after these expansions were published, which is kind of a shame because I think the designers really tried to do something here. The quality of the work is evident. The game, however, for whatever reason, just didn't get any traction. As I mentioned, though, the Dungeons & Dragons miniatures game, which followed Chainmail, lasted for about eight years in various incarnations, so perhaps it was simply a better fit for the company's existing customer base. Okay, that's a wrap for today. As I said earlier, chainmail figures aren't that expensive on the secondhand market, so if you're looking for some classic figs for Frostgrave, Sword Weirdos, or your favorite fantasy RPG, maybe check them out. We'll be back soon with some more tabletop wargaming stuff, but until then, I hope you're having some fun out there. Take care of yourselves, and we'll catch you next time.